Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 286. Written by Pepper Antique. Well. This is Cheapside. Artair said as he and Coros pulled up on the small town. Another week and we'll be in the capital. Coros pulled her horse up to the hitching post at the edge of the town. They'd gotten the little spotted mare only a few days before from an army garrison. Artair hitched Xalia to a sturdy tree some dozen yards or so away. She reached into a pouch on her belt and grabbed a bit of bread as she signaled for green eyes. A few moments later the raven landed on her arm and cooed at her. Word? She asked the bird. Green eyes looked back the way he'd come. More town gone. He said in his raven voice. She gasped at the simple message. Another town is gone? She asked. The raven stared at her for a moment, then nodded its head up and down twice. Shit! She said to herself. Prince Er. Rider. She called out. He looked over from where he was pulling his overnight bag out of one of Xalia's saddlebags. He read the worry on her face easy enough. Another one? He asked with a look of concern. That's three now. Did he say where? She turned back to green eyes. Where at little brother? She asked as she handed him a bit of jerky that he gobbled up greedily. The raven hopped up and down in a circle, then nipped at her hair. River. He said. Small town. No shiny. Some kind of river village. She yelled over to the prince. Small enough that there were no soldiers. He shook his head as he approached. Meaning they didn't get evacuated. He said. He'd sent word back to the garrison she'd been part of when they'd reached the first town on their journey, ordering them to evacuate the nearest towns as best as they could to prevent further casualties. But the net still had holes. Maybe we should keep riding. She said as she began undoing the horse's tether. No. He said sternly. We need to stay at least the night. Let the mounts rest. Plus we'll let the locals know what's happening and to be ready to evacuate as well. Was it getting closer? She asked the raven. It hopped up and down and nodded. Then shook. Then nodded again. Helpful. She said sarcastically. Come on. The prince said. Let's find ourselves some rooms and talk to the town sheriff. Hello Captain Choi. The door said as he approached. He didn't think he'd ever get over the discomfort that caused every time it happened. Morning. Door. He replied before yawning. Vilari in? Yes. The door replied. Do come in. James stepped forward through the now open doorway and into the lab. Hey Vel. He said to the back of the small mage as she studied a book on her desk while mixing a flask of something blue. Morning James. She said half-heartedly. How are you? Looking for a distraction. He said honestly. You ever figure out the design I gave you way back? For the fund you machine? She asked as she set the flask down gently and slowly stepped away from the desk, watching it as if it might explode at any moment. Which, for all he knew, it might. Farm do. He corrected as he eyed the desk curiously. Should I be worried about that? She shook her head. Just don't speak too loudly or bump that table. She said. And yes. Like I said before, it's an easy enough design. We'll just need to enchant some basic fire magic into it. Are you finally asking to? Wait. That's right. You said you'd already learned enchanting. I've been meaning to ask about that. James nodded, and before she could continue the line of questioning he drew his sword and held it out to her, handle first. Vilairi snatched it quickly and her eyes began glowing two separate colors. She gasped as she studied it and held it out a bit further, as if she was almost scared of it. That a good gasp or a bad gasp? James asked. James. She said hesitantly as she turned the blade over and inspected the other side. What exactly happened while you were reforging and re-enchanting this blade? King Farik put down the papers as his daughter entered. 
he did what he could to hide the concern at what the report in the stack had informed him of. Father. She greeted. Amina. He replied as he gestured at the chair across from him. How is he? How do you think he is? She asked rather gruffly. He's exactly how I said he would be. Her knuckles whitened from gripping the arms of her chair. He didn't return until well after nightfall last night. Stable hands reported him sleeping in his drake's pen most of the day. The king nodded. For what it's worth. Tell him I'm sorry. He said. Then he held up the report. We're going to have to speed up your marriage. He said with no humor. Unless you want it postponed by another emergency. He slid the papers across his desk and she snatched them up angrily. He waited as she read over them. She lowered the papers and looked off into space as she thought about the contents. That can't be right. She said. That's, the other side of the country. She looked back at the report. Entire towns? How's that possible? She asked. Are there any reports of blight possessed? He spread the papers in front of him a bit and shook his head. No mention of them so far. He replied. Not that we know enough about what they're capable of to know if that means anything. And with us not even knowing where this is originating from. What are we doing about it? She asked. What little we can. He answered. Sigbert has dispatched 300 of the earth arrows to the surrounding towns. It's all we can spare. Plus your brother Artair of all people put out orders for evacuation of neighboring towns. Really? She asked. That's a change for him. Indeed. And it couldn't be at a better time. He's on his way here with an eyewitness of some kind. Should we dispatch griffin riders? She asked. Already done. He said. So what can I do? She wondered. For now. Nothing. He admitted. I asked you to come to ask about James. You could have asked him yourself. She replied with a bit of anger. No. He said. I've got a feeling that I'm one of the last people he wants to see right now. Wonder why? She said testily. He glared at her for just a moment. Then his face softened. You know W-H-Y Amina. He said, and his voice sounded weary. He was about to say more when there was a knock at the door. Who's there? He asked. The guard outside answered. The archmage sir. Another time daughter. He said before looking back at the door. Enter. The door opened, and Archmage Marcos entered, hobbling on his cane as he approached. What is it Marcos? He asked. I believe. The old mage began before plopping into the chair next to Amina's. That I have successfully replicated the designs given to us by the captain. Amina copped an eyebrow. Designs? She asked curiously. There is a small issue of power. Marcos continued as if not hearing the question. The Earth, er, uh, scientists, use something called um, nuclear power. We, do not have access to such things. Father. Amina interrupted. What is he talking about? King Farik looked at her with no emotion. He's talking about taking the upper hand from Earth. He said grimly. Then he turned back to Marcos. Do you have an alternative for the power issue? He asked. Driscoll looked around at the people around him. How long had this presentation been going on that he'd zoned out? Had he actually fallen asleep? That couldn't be right. Anyways, that's how we're going to get the Earth prisoners out of the capital. The odd, green-skinned man said as they gestured at the map. Any questions? A young woman in mage robe spoke up. Don't the Petravians have earth weapons now? She asked. What's our answer to that? Driscoll was just about to replay his suit's cameras to catch up on whatever the plan had been while he was zoned out. Chief Driscoll? The speaker addressed him, drawing his attention unexpectedly. That's your field. How do we counter the, rifles? 
Right? He nodded without meaning to. Right. He said. And the key is gonna be armor. Your mags are all capable of creating shields, right? He asked. A large portion of the group nodded or murmured affirmative. Good. Those worked in the desert. He said. The rest of us will just have to wear good old fashioned armor. He said while gesturing at his suit. Speaking of. The speaker interrupted. Our priority among the prisoners is the Major and the other members of Chief Driscoll's squad. Driscoll flinched at that. His squad had been captured? That can't be right. He said to himself inside his helmet. Weren't they? But where was that question leading him? Something had happened to his squad. But what? If we can recover the chief squad they will be a massive force multiplier to our forces. The speaker continued. Plus their suits will give us access to massive amounts of information on the castle and its forces. No. He thought. They would use that intel. But his people didn't just share intel. But then again, he just had only moments before. He looked around. Who were these people? And where was he? I'm sorry. He said, interrupting the speaker. Actually no. I'm not. He admitted as everyone turned to look at him. But who the fuck are you people? We're the agency. The speaker answered matter-of-factly. We recovered you from the desert to help us strike back at the Petravians. They looked at him curiously. Are you okay chief? I'm fine. He said. But you're bullshitting me. What? One of the people around him asked. First off. He began, counting on his fingers. I don't remember any of that shit. Second, me and my people don't get captured unless we want to get captured. And we can break out any time we want. He held up a third finger. Lastly, my squad. He shook his head as a migraine formed. My squad is. Something made him not want to remember it. My squad is. Chief. The speaker interrupted. We're working with your command remember. We gave you the recovery verification phrase once your people warned us about it. Yeah. He said as he looked up at them with a look of anger. And what was that? He asked. The speaker looked over at one of the people off to their side, an older looking woman in a hooded robe. Sherman's March, 2735, Whiskey, Niner. The woman said. Driscoll looked at the log in his suit's files. Sure enough that was one of the codes. And what mission does that correspond to? He challenged. Something called the Suez blockade. She answered. Then she corrected herself. Uh, the Suez blockade failure. She said. Shit. He said to himself. Does that mean that I'm wrong about the guys? He wondered. But what was I wrong about? Chief? The speaker asked again. You okay? He looked up at them, suddenly uncertain. No. He said. I think something's wrong. Well. It's still a few days before the royal wedding. The speaker said. Go see the healers. Maybe you were hurt worse than we realized. We still don't fully understand how your suit works with your physiology. Maybe we missed something. Yeah. He said hesitantly as he stood up. Yeah maybe that's a good idea. Sorry for the interruption. As he left the room, it faded out of existence. Except for the old hooded woman, who smiled wryly before stepping into a wall and disappearing. 